Hello, hi, welcome to yet another video uh, with me, Adrian Lee, the wandering art historian. I gotta say, we're creeping up towards the end of our incredible web series, How to Read a Painting. We've already covered colors and symbols, the clues that help us to read these paintings. So what is left to cover? next few videos all about stories. Now, how are we going to cover such an incredible topic? Here's how we're gonna do it. Part one will be mythological stories. That's this video right here. Number two, religious stories. And number three, genre and moral stories. And why is it super important to study repeated stories in art history. Well, that's why I'm kicking this part of the series off with mythological stories because I want to show you how um, powerful and profound these mythological stories are to humans in general, general, but also to art historians because we just keep going back to these stories again and again, even in modern art. Yes, I'm gonna tie it all back into modern art. Are you ready? I hope so, cause I'm ready. Do you remember that we have already discussed quite a few mythological stories thus far in our web series? There are dozens, if not hundreds of Greek and Roman gods and goddesses. So that's a lot, that's a lot of stories to cover, right? Um, plus all the lesser deities. There are some half God, half human characters. A bunch of humans play roles in these stories. And if you remember to previous discussion, you'll recall that uh, mythological stories were a really good way to kind of explain the inexplicable, right? Why is there a war? Why is there famine? How did a whole continent come to be, right? So these mythological stories, retained a lot of power. Um, it was also a good way to explain good and bad luck and humans irrational behavior because you could just say, oh, well, the gods made him do it, right? Interesting, isn't it? Um, so let's think back to when we are reviving all these mythological stories and that is the time period known as the Renaissance. Remember that? We've, we've covered this a little bit before. Because if you think about it, the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, we lost a lot of our culture, right? Academia, uh, knowledge, information, things like that. So when you're rebuilding culture and society, you're gonna skip over that dark part and you're gonna go back to antiquity, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Thus, the power of mythological stories. Heck, used to rebuild society and culture altogether during the Renaissance. Yeah, we gotta talk about these stories. Do you remember these two stories that we've already discussed? So we've got the Judgment of Paris, right? Very uh, cool cosmic beauty pageant, right? Uh, the Triumph of Galatea, love that one, very cool. Do you remember we talked about Atalanta and Hippomenes and the golden apples and the foot race? So epic, right? We also talked about Theseus slaying the Minotaur. Very cool uh, metaphor, if you will. Um, we even talked about uh, the ad abduction of Europa and how the whole entire continent of Europe came to be. Very convenient, isn't it? Um, and we've also talked about uh, Lida and the Swan, right? Um, gosh, so much, so much bestiality, right? I mean, eek. Okay, so let me give you yet another example of one of these repeated mythological stories. And the one I have chosen for you is this. And if you're looking at this and you're like, Adrian, I don't, uh, wh uh, what are my clues? What do I have to go on? Don't worry, we will read this painting together. But it's an important story because 
it's part of the inspiration for a phrase that we say a lot in art history. Uh, we, you may have heard me use a couple of phrases like the golden age of Dutch Baroque painting, one of those kinds of phrases, sure. Um, and this phrase is the classic female nude. Have you ever heard that phrase before, the classic female nude? Well, this is where we get that term from. It's this idea, classic, referring to like antiquity, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and the reclining nude or just um, the beautiful naked woman depiction, okay? And it's important because I am going somewhere with this and we may end up in modern art, okay? Bear with me. What is going on here? Well, first of all, this is called Sleeping Venus. It's from about 1508 to 1510, and it's by this artist named Giorgione. And what's very interesting is not only is this a lovely painting, but it is a painting that he worked on with his pupil, as we've seen with um, some Renaissance paintings, the, the major artists would have some of their students work with them. And what I think is so fascinating is the pupil in, uh, in question here is our boy Titian. Yeah, even Titian had to get his start somewhere, right? So what did he contribute? Well, let's read this painting together and see if we can figure it out, okay? So what's going on here? Well, first of all, let's look at our landscape. Classic Italian Renaissance landscape. It's almost like an ideal or utopian landscape. Do you notice here in the background, we've got our atmospheric perspective. We mentioned that in a previous video where the further um, things get back in the distance, the more they turn hazy or blue, or purple, that kind of thing. Um, do you notice that it also has kind of a, a slight brownish kind of sepia tone, that sfumato that we see a lot with Leonardo da Vinci, right? Um, what else? Um, well, we have this beautiful, lovely lady um, sleeping, sound asleep in this beautiful utopia. She's got her blankets here and very prominent red blanket here. Um, she's completely nude, that's pretty obvious. Um, however, she covers her genitalia ever so casually, thus making her modest in the eyes of art history. Yes, that's modesty in the eyes of art historians. Great, right? So who is this? This is sleeping Venus. And do we remember who Venus is? The goddess of love. Why would this depiction be so important? Well, it was actually the visual representation of a very beloved uh, romantic love poem that was very popular during Roman weddings. And the premise would be that the couple that was getting married would have this poem read, and the story was that um, Cupid would hear this story being read, and he would go and fetch his mother, right, who is Venus, and she would awake from her slumber in this utopian paradise, and that she would um, kind of appear at the wedding or attend the wedding of this newlywed couple and bless them with eternal love and happiness and happily ever after and all that jazz. So what we see here is the visual representation of a poem like that, the sleeping Venus, she is in her utopia. She's just at rest waiting to be awakened by her Cupid or a putti to attend the next lover's wedding. Now, most depictions of a sleeping Venus would include a putti or Cupid, but we don't really see one in this painting, right? What's so cool is that that image, there was a Cupid or a Puti included in this painting, but it has since kind of disintegrated and been lost to time. Yes, uh, scientists have actually studied this particular painting and um, 
used kind of like an x-ray to look through all the different layers of paint, and they have found traces of a cupid or putti at the feet of Venus. Why is that important? That was Titian's job. That was his contribution to this painting. He was in charge of painting the Cupid or Puti at the feet of Sleeping Venus, and sadly, it has since been lost to time. Okay, so with this kind of background on the motif of the Sleeping Venus, let's look at another one. This is a very famous painting uh, referred to as the Venus of Urbino. And this was painted about 30 years after the painting we just looked at. So that's around 1538-ish. And why is this particular painting so famous? Because this one's by our boy Titian. Yes, he grew up to be a famous artist and he painted his own version of Sleeping Venus. However, he made some very creative artistic choices, didn't he? Because first and foremost, Venus is not asleep. It looks like she just woke up. She has this kind of placid, serene, happy look on her face, like she just woke up from a, a wonderful dream. Of course, she's still super modest, right? Okay, um, but let's look at a couple other creative choices that Titian made with his Venus of Urbino. Um, well, first of all, we're indoors. We're not in a typical, ideal Italian Renaissance landscape. Um, however, um, we do look like we're in kind of a fancy house, right? Um, we do have a window to the outside world. It looks kind of like dusk. Maybe she's waking up for the evening's events, maybe a party. Um, in the window, we have a myrtle tree, another symbol of the goddess of love. Um, we have two maid servants, and they are looking through these chests. Um, number one, she has maid servants. Well, she is a goddess. I mean, come on. Um, but it is also a fancy house. So maybe Titian's implying that Venus is also pretty rich, wealthy, perhaps. Um, some also, some art historians suggest that these chests are also bridal chests. Um, and that these maid servants are possibly picking out her next gown or outfit. In fact, we do see this maid servant with a dress over her shoulder. She may be getting ready for the night's events, like a party, as we mentioned. Um, we have this very interesting curtain here pulled back. It's kind of difficult to see. It's gotten a little bit dark over time. Um, we see her reclining in a bed um, while she's not asleep. We do see her with her beautiful hair, this epic braid, and then the curls of her hair cascading down. She's got beautiful earrings in, a beautiful bangle bracelet, a ring on her finger, so she sleeps in her jewels. Um, she's holding a bouquet of red roses, as we've discussed, yet another symbol of the goddess of love, and her bed is bright red, which makes sense, red for love, romance, passion, lust. What is very interesting is that instead of a Cupid or a Puti, who do we have at the feet of this Venus? We've got our sleeping puppy now. Why that choice? Well, as a symbol, we've talked about how dogs um, are associated with fidelity, which is how they get their nickname Fido. But they're also a very big symbol of loyalty, especially in marriage. So by putting together all of these clues, um, it may have been that this painting uh, was for a young newlywed couple to celebrate their recent wedding or marriage. They might hang a painting like this in their bedroom to help facilitate some uh, sexy romantical type times. Um, also maybe as a way to encourage fertility so that they could have children. So it's a really cool painting, isn't it? And a very interesting take 
on the sleeping Venus motif. I gotta say, very cool thing that Titian has done here. Um, we've got the red of the bed and the maid servant is red. If you connect those two reds, it creates a diagonal line through this painting. Who or what creates the other diagonal line? Well, Venus herself. Where do these two lines cross? Conveniently, right in Venus's um, modesty area, right? Okay, so when you look at paintings like this, you start to see the pattern and that's part of the glory of studying repeated stories throughout art history because you see the clues, you see the repetition, you know, oh, I see who he's depicting. That's clearly a sleeping Venus motif, even if the artist has made their own creative choices. Now, we've seen this before. I showed you this slide already of Lida and the Swan, where each artist made their own creative choices, but still gave us enough clues to figure out what story was being told again and again, right? And do you remember where we ended up with this story? We ended up in modern art talking about Salvador Dali's take on Lida and the Swan, right? Yes, so I wanna do the same thing with all of you with this sleeping Venus motif. Are you ready for this? Okay, here we go. Yeah, hmm, bit different, isn't it? This is our painting Olympia by Edouard Manet. This was painted in 1863, very auspicious year for art history. Um, shall we read this together? Let's look for our clues to, to see if this is a sleeping Venus motif. Well, first of all, I gotta say, number one, I don't see any red anywhere in this painting. Maybe a couple of hints at some orange, a little bit. But what color really stands out? Green. And if this painting was painted in 1863, do you remember our video on color and specifically the color green? Yeah, this is an example of that Paris green I was telling you about. Remember the scientists and the chemists finally came up with the right chemical compound to make a, a green dye and it became so trendy. The people of Paris, France put this color on everything only to find out when everybody started to die that it was filled with arsenic. Not great times for Paris, France, right? Well, we have, if anything, what it implies is that this lady is very trendy, right? Because that color green was very fashionable and trendy for its time. Um, she's clearly laying on a bed. However, um, this lady is definitely not asleep, right? Definitely not that coy, oh, I just woke up from the best nap of my life look. She's wide awake. She looks very confident. She looks very stoic and she's looking right out at us, at the viewer. It's a little uncomfortable feeling, isn't it? She does have a maidservant who is bringing her flowers. Um, I wonder if those flowers are a gift. Hmm, gift from someone, maybe, perhaps. Um, what other clues do we see here? Well, she has this kind of silk robe on the bed. Um, she is kind of like our previous Venus where she has all of her jewelry on. Do you notice we've got a necklace, earrings, a bangle. She even has a flower in her hair. I do not wear flowers in my hair when I go to bed, but hmm. Um, do you notice her shoes are still on? Yes, she's laying in bed completely nude, except for her shoes. Interesting. Um, I gotta point out, um, uh, remember how we said modesty was so easy to achieve by just gently covering your genitals. Um, do you notice this lady's hand? That's 
that's very, hmm, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you would call this particular lady modest, right? Um, what's the last thing that you notice about this particular painting? Yeah, is there a cupid or a putti at the feet of this lady? Nope. Is there a cute, adorable sleeping puppy? Nope. What is there? That is a black cat. Okay, so first of all, there's that. But do you notice it's also in kind of like a scared position, like its back is arched, its tail is up, and he kind of looks like when the hair stands up on the back because they're startled. Yeah, let's put all of these together. Is this a sleeping Venus motif. Well, when you compare the two, you might say no. However, it does imply that Manet made these creative choices on purpose, with intent. And he did. And guess what? This painting, Olympia, made a number of people very angry they felt kind of like they were, uh, like, like Manet was trying to play a trick on them because they said, well, you have kind of the clues, you kind of have the symbols of Venus, you kind of do, but who is this lady? Because clearly this is not Venus. And they were right. What Manet was making a comment on was the idea of a prostitute or courtesan in modern Paris, France, um, as kind of a, a business lady with her own job, if you will. And I think it's a very interesting way to tie it back to Venus, but I can see why the public at large maybe didn't react too favorably because they were basically saying, we were looking for Venus, but you gave us a prostitute. But Manet was just uh, saying, why can't they still be one and the same? Uh, this painting was actually in included in the Paris Salon of 1865, two years after it was painted. However, guards had to be posted by the painting to keep people from attacking it. Yes, they were very angry, so that's how they expressed their anger over this particular painting. Yikes, right? Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. If you have a dollar or two to donate to my virtual tip jar, that would be super awesome. If not, maybe like my videos, share them with your friends, and subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can see more videos like this. My name is Adrian Lee. You can call me the art Wandering Art Historian. Thank you for hanging out with me for another video. I'll see you next time.